Grab a pill and meet me down by the dick dock because we have episode 3 of American Horror Story double feature and this is our bloodiest one yet. In this video we'll be taking a deep dive into Red Tide, clues and theories on what might happen, and greater connections to the AHS universe. So pour yourself some delicious blood and make sure to like and subscribe, seriously only 12% of you are subscribed, because we're getting right into it. Well it hasn't been one minute into the episode and Doris has already mentioned Lyme disease. Now I want get her tested for lime and rabies. In my episode 1 and 2 breakdown, I'll leave a link to that in the description below, I talked about how Lyme disease may be the key to thwarting off and or poisoning those who drink its tainted blood. Of course, Doris is concerned her daughter may have it after witnessing her eat a dead rabbit at the end of episode 2. And if things couldn't get worse for the Gardner family, Chief Burleson has stopped on by, saying some of the townsfolk noticed a young girl covered in blood coming from the cemetery. I'm not sure if any Anyone else noticed this, but they spelled her name wrong on the name tag. On the official AHS poster and on IMDb, it's B-U-R-L-E-S-O-N, and I'm not exactly sure if this is a mistake or if it was addressed and just cut from the show. Burleson is the new chief in town, so it's totally possible someone messed up the name while making her new tag. We also get a better view of the Chief's Provincetown Police insignia, which says Pilgrim's First Landing Place, with the year 1620, a different date on the Provincetown founding marker here, which claims 1686. 1620 is the date the Mayflower landed in Provincetown, and the Mayflower is even mentioned in this episode. Unless your family came over on the Mayflower or launched off Falmouth to hunt a whale or two, You'll always be an outsider. I'd be surprised if a flashback to that era doesn't happen this season. The chief wants to talk to Alma after the markings on the dead rabbit look similar to those of a dead hustler found along the shore. This is referring to the man Harry killed at the end of episode 2. But when the chief goes to collect Alma, Doris collapses and falls down the stairs, an event which the doctor at the hospital later says were caused by false contractions brought on by stress. For safety, Doris will have to stay in the hospital for the next 4-5 to five days. She has a history of having miscarriages. This leaves Harry a lot of time to get into trouble. He ends up giving Alma some money for the vending machine, but she only has her eyes on those sweet, sweet packets of blood. We saw her taking one of those black pills last episode, which has resulted in her having an insatiable taste for blood. Harry lies to Doris, telling her he'll take Alma back to New York, but he has no intention to do so. The allure of the black pill and his work is too much, and if he keeps this up for the rest of the season and doesn't see the error of his ways, this season will will likely end in tragedy. Alma really creeps me out. She has this almost sociopath type quality where the only thing she cares about is her art. She doesn't care about her mom and that people who don't have talent could just disappear one day and it wouldn't matter. It's tough to say if this is the result of the pill or if she's always been like this since every time she's said something along those lines, it's been post pill. So Alma makes a deal with her dad not to take the pill if he doesn't either. And that lasted for about two seconds. Alma even catches him doing it and demands one too, which, him being the number one dad, gives it to her. It makes me think about what Austin said in episode two, that once you take the pill, you can't go back to normal. It's like trying to screw with a dick full of Novocaine. Once you take the pill, you can't get hard without it. At the Muse, Harry and Alma discuss the situation. Harry's concerned about the side effects the pill could have on a younger girl. Not to mention with his work, he can generate scripts for three months, then try to get off the pill. But with her, she needs to be on it all the time to play music. In the meantime, he tells her to never feed off anyone. He'll bring the blood to her. And there's just such a great attention to detail here, like Alma drinking a Shirley Temple, named after a child entertainer in the arts, plus the addition of grenadine, which which gives it that red tinge. Harry, like Belle Noir in Austin, uses Craigslist to hunt his next victim, an addict on the outskirts of town who likes to show off her panties. Unfortunately for Harry, he's the one being hunted, finding himself tied up in the basement of a horny couple who makes sexy snuff films. It's so gross, I hope you didn't catch Tony lubing himself up with a can of Crisco. Tony here is played by actor Blake Shields, who you might remember from the American Horror Stories Feral episode starring Cody Fern. What Tony and this girl don't realize is that Harry can use his fang teeth he got from Lark last episode to chew through his confines and surprise attack them, feeding off the woman, shooting Tony, and putting some blood in a red thermos to later feed to Alma. 
I sure hope Harry deleted that tape recording. Ursula shows up unannounced at Harry's doorstep. She's Harry's Hollywood agent who's been fielding nothing but offers for Harry after he turned in his best work yet. Hell, even Joaquin Phoenix wants to star in his next feature. She comes to tell him that Quentin Tarantino wants him to write his first limited series, which has already been greenlit by Hulu. Hulu being the streaming platform you can watch AHS on. Hashtag not an ad. It's even hinted that Quentin used the black pills to write his movies, and now that he's off them, he needs someone like Harry to do the job. Ursula will be staying at the Land's End Inn, which also happens to be the name of a book we've seen Harry have on his desk, which takes place in Provincetown. That night at the Muse, Ursula cringes at a duet between Austin and Belle Noir. Clearly, she doesn't understand good music. Her interaction with them doesn't go over too well, and even Mickey gets the cold shoulder. I like my men with considerably darker complexions and a lot less meth running through their veins. The next day, however, Mickey tracks her down by the beach, hearing from the bellhop at the inn that she's a big Hollywood agent. We know that Mickey has always dreamed of being a writer, and he's been writing like crazy ever since he took one of Belle's stolen black pills. This gamble pays off for Mickey as later that night, Ursula reads his script and is blown away. But more importantly, Ursula starts to notice something weird going on in Provincetown, and she wants to know exactly what it is. Sorry, homeboy, but there is something weird going on out here, and I want to know what it is. She jokes that it could be aliens making people so talented, which is a slight nod to part two of Double Feature, which includes aliens. Ursula goes on to note that not only have Mickey and Harry turned in amazing work, she recognized Belle and Austin from the bar as being famous artists as well. And with the promise of Mickey achieving his dreams of being a famous writer, Mickey tells her about the black pills. If Ursula had a steady stream of those, she could create her own boutique agency and make millions. So she tasks Mickey with getting some, or his scripts go in the garbage. At Belle's house, we see the red light on. We saw this in previous episodes, but we're not 100% sure what it means. Like it could be something to ward off the pale creatures, or a sign that the person inside has gone off to feed, which is where Belle is going right now. I like how her house number is just one off from 666. So Mickey breaks into her house, and I love how in this episode we'll see him break into a lot of things, a total role reversal from Home Alone. After sorting through Belle's vibrators, ew, Mickey eventually stumbles upon the pills and takes some. Meanwhile, Belle, Austin, and Harry find a new group of addicts to feed off, and Harry takes the opportunity to steal some blood for Alma. This triggers Belle to hold a gun to him, asking who the blood is for. And instead of Harry being like, oh, I wanted some for later, he immediately tells her it's for his daughter who took one of the pills. Belle tells him Alma's a liability, and that she's not to be given any more before he's dropped off. But when Austin and Belle are alone, Belle says Harry must be killed. This is a position that is later echoed by the chemist who wants the entire family killed. At the dick dock, Mickey's thirst for blood leads him in a very sloppy fight with a hustler named Beefy. Beefy's corpse will later wash ashore and be found by local police. Belle visits Mickey at his shack, wanting answers about the missing pills. Mickey doesn't deny it, saying the pills have made him just like her and Austin, talented. But Belle scoffs at the comparison. Honey. You're a paper airplane and not a 747. If Mickey wants more of those pills, he'll have to do Belle a favor, kill Ursula. After all, it was Ursula who criticized her singing. I don't like it when people criticize my singing. She also demands for every one of his kills, two to three thermoses full of blood. Maybe Belle Noir just wants some extra blood around, but so far I've associated thermoses with Alma. And since Belle Noir exclaims in this episode her love for young blood, I wouldn't be surprised if she has other plans for Alma. As Burleson takes care of the latest body to wash ashore, we get our first introduction of Dennis O'Hare's Holden Vaughn. He witnessed the murder, but was too far to get a good glimpse of the killer. The interesting thing here is that Holden is a famous interior designer. Doris is also an interior designer. I wonder if these two will meet. In the previews, we saw Holden stumble upon some severed body parts while walking his greyhounds. He tells Burleson the reason he's in town is that he can't go back to New York because one of his greyhounds died there and he needs a period of mourning. Does this mean this shot is a flashback or does Holden have more than two dogs? With Holden being a famous designer, does that mean he's also been taking the black pills? So Mickey's gone full home alone with that crowbar on his way to murder. Ursula, but when he finds out Ursula has already lined him up to be the writer for the next Speed Racer reboot, he's like, murder who now? 
Ursula wants to know where those black pills came from, so if Mickey wants this writing up, he'll have to take her to them. At the chemist's house, we can see the door knocker is of a mermaid. We know part one is called Red Tide, and the preview materials, as well as Ryan Murphy himself, have hinted at sirens and sea creatures, but to be honest, we haven't got a lot of that yet. Maybe they're holding out on us, or maybe the chemist's black pills are somehow connected to the sea. Regardless, Ursula tells her that she can make a lot of money selling these in Hollywood, and proposes a partnership. A partnership which the chemist rejects. With the chemist not wanting to become super rich, it makes me wonder what her true motivations are. Why give out these pills seemingly for free? Why make them in the first place? It's also interesting to note that the chemist does not keep a copy of the recipe anywhere, so if she dies, so too does the recipe with it. The chemist tells Belle and Austin to kill Ursula, Mickey, and all of the Gardner family. So it looks like things are going to be pretty hairy for Harry in the upcoming weeks. With Harry needing to obtain more blood, he asks Ursula to babysit Alma. Because what could go wrong when asking someone to babysit your bloodthirsty daughter? The chief is actually watching the house, and when Harry leaves, she pays a visit to Alma. She knows something is up, and asks if it's some sort of cult or blood virus, both nods to previous seasons of AHS, Cult, and Hotel. She even remarks on how Alma and Doris have old-sounding names, which she surmises is because of nostalgia. This is a fun nod to Alma and Doris, both being names used in previous seasons of AHS. Alma Walker from Asylum, and Doris Cairns Goodwin in Roanoke. The chief says she's taking in Alma to the station, and when Harry gets there, he'll be arrested. But before she can, Alma murders her in cold blood. But what's even more disturbing is when Harry comes home to find Burleson's dead body, Ursula and Alma are playing a casual game of gin rummy. Ursula now has some leverage on Harry in her quest to find out what's going on. He'll have no choice but to do what she says now that she knows about Alma killing the chief of police in their very own living room. Also, also pretty sad that we didn't get a TB Karen appearance this week. That's the end of episode 3 which sees a lot of moving pieces of the story shifting. If the trailer for episode 4 is out soon, I'll try to do a breakdown on that and look for even more clues. Thanks for watching everyone, make sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes you can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time remember, Daddy loves you very much.